questions after the talk. What a silly notion. I'm going to be asking you questions all throughout the talk. It would be grossly unfair if you could not ask me questions as well. So if you have any questions, don't bother queuing them. Just put up your hand. Um, I'm going to talk about performance bugs. Programs that are absolutely correct, that do just what they're supposed to do, but they cost too much to do it. I'll start off with two little stories, give you some perspective, some tales, some lessons. I was pretty confused over the background of the people that might be here. If you have written a computer program ever in your life, please raise your hand. Thank you. If you didn't raise your hand just then, now raise your hand now. Okay, that's great. If you're a computer programmer, I'm showing you some code. Think of code as code. I know there is at least one person in here who's not a full-time computer programmer, but she soon will be, I trust, my full-time daughter-in-law. Um, and so if you're not so much of a programmer, think of code as blah, blah, blah. It's a little inside joke that we programmers have. Uh, and you'll get most of the story, but if you're, no, if you're a programmer, you'll get a little bit more. Who here feels comfortable with the term quadratic growth? Yeah, <laughs> close enough. I'll work around it. Good, so I, I won't even talk. If I double the diameter of a circle, how much bigger will the area get? Four, cool. We're cool. Um, buying in bulk. This is a little bit more background. Some economics 1.01. If you buy gasoline, doesn't matter if you have a moped or I filled up an ambulance I drive the other day with about 30 gallons of fuel. Fuel this morning was about 371 a gallon. Two weeks ago it was that. That's unit cost. Sometimes, though, there's economy of scale. Buy 12, get one free. That's a baker's dozen. Fast food. They essentially penalize you for not getting super mongo drinks. Um, I've seen places that sell, the, it's a small, medium, and large. Actually, it's a medium, large, and XL, or it's an XL, XXL, and the gut buster, whatever it is, um, where it's, the incremental cost getting bigger isn't that much. On the other hand, sometimes there are diseconomies of scale. So we went across the street over to the lobster restaurant, and I was shocked that the price of lobster did not follow this thing. I went to a website recently. The, more, the bigger the lobster is, the more it costs per pound. So if you buy a one-pound lobster, it costs nine bucks. If you buy two of them, it's 18 bucks. Two pounds of lobster is 18 bucks. But if you buy a two the three pound lobster down here, a two pounder there will cost you 25 bucks. Sometimes there's a diseconomy of scale. The more you buy, the more it costs. What a pain that is. Anyone think of any other examples of diseconomies of scale? Power. Pardon me? Computer power. Computer power, getting that last little bit costs a whole lot more. Other examples? Children. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, 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 I cleverly stopped at one, which is way beyond the optimal number. Um, uh, Bill Engvall sells I'm stupid signs, which go for a dollar a piece or two for five dollars. Um, uh, if I, in my spare time, I'm a search and rescue technician. If a person, if you get a team out after two hours and the search radius uh, if a team of 40 people can search, if you wait to four hours, how big will your team have to be to search? It won't be twice as much in twice the time. It'll be four times as much. There's some diseconomy of scale. We'll get to that. That's background, as they say. Here's a great bug report. We, this happened to be Alan Wilkes and Rick Becker, found that QSort, it was code that I was maintaining, is unbearably slow. Yeah, that by itself isn't, isn't that great a bug report. But this makes it a pretty good bug report. On inputs, on pipe organ inputs, like 01234689987654321010. That's interesting. That's really useful. That's a pretty good bug report. This is a great bug report. Here's a teeny weeny little eight line program that tickles the bug for you. Wow. And not only that, here are the timings. If I run it with a certain value for the number of things to sort at 2,000, it takes that long. Intuitively, if I run it to sort twice as many ele uh, elements, you would think it would take about twice as much time. But they did the experiment, 
And here, if you double the number of elements, instead of taking ballpark 12 seconds, it takes ballpark how many times as long? They do it again, 21 to 85, it takes four times as long. This is a great bug report. Here, the problem is this code that you're responsible for takes too long. Here's the generic family of inputs, and here's the pattern. They could have just given me one pair of elements. They gave me three. Every time we double the input size, the runtime goes up by a factor of four. You would like to think that with economy of scale, it might get a little bit less than doubling. If you know a bit about the theory of sword and say, well, it's going to be a just a little bit more than doubling, but in fact, it goes up by a factor of four, there's something seriously wrong. A great bug report. This simple little experiment establishes that a sort that should have that magic number of runtime is in fact quadratic. Bummer. In fact, here's the way it happened. Behind this, um, there was a person using the S software system, and they thought that S had broken. They said it just stopped running. I was running my program, I gave it a command, instead of coming back, it just sat there, it broke, it didn't do anything else. In fact, Wilkes and Becker discovered that it would have finished in about a week. The maintainers hunted down the real issue, they found the piece that was broken, and they found the organ pipe issue. That, that was, and then they wrote this great bug report. I'll return to the point uh, where I came on, where the next step was to build a new one that fixed that issue. So I'll get back to that in a few minutes. But that's my first tale, a bug report, a program that took way too long. Any questions before I move on? Here's another bug. Or the, actually, before I get to that, it's a delicate discussion. Henry Petrosky, in his wonderful book that he wrote a quarter century ago called To Engineer as Human, talks about, quote, the role of failure in successful design. And he says in his book, that the lessons we learn from disasters can do more to advance engineering knowledge than all the successes you can imagine. That we as engineers have to talk not only about our successes, we have to talk about our failures, and in fact, our disasters are the most interesting and educational kinds of, of failures. I have now been paid to be a computer programmer for longer than the majority of you have been breathing. Um, uh, I've worked at a, some of the best places in the galaxy, Xerox Park, the Stanford Linux Accelerator Center, a lot of really fine places, and real software has bugs. Joseph Campbell described mythology by speaking of the hero with a thousand faces. I'm going to speak to you today of the bug with a thousand faces. I'm going to take them from particular examples, but if you work on big software systems, you see them. Everyone makes mistakes. Excellent organizations learn from them, and I've been privileged to work at a number of organizations that allow me to talk about this. When the fault is mine, I'll take it. Otherwise, it's not really important who made these bugs. It's pretty interesting to see them, though. If you're a programmer, at some point in your life, you've probably written code along these lines. Count is equal to zero, and then somewhere much later it's iterated. Increment count, plus plus count, if that's bigger than 100, do something expensive. I, one time out of 100 I want to do this, then you reset count to zero. There are three lines of code there. There are possibilities to make mistakes in each one of those three lines. What mistakes could you make? What impact would that have? Let's try it. What happens if I forget to initialize that count to zero? Is that some big deal? It depends on the language. If count happens to be initialized implicitly to zero, I'm golden. What if count happens to be some garbage value that was there? Is that some big deal? Well, if it happened to be 138, the first time I'm golden, the first time I'll do that one extra time, I'll do it one extra time, then I'm fine. If count, what's the only real bummer, though, that could happen here? If count happens to be a really small negative number, instead of doing it in over 100 times, I could either have little change or I could never do it. I can never get to it. Yikes. Leave out one line of code, something you wanted to happen, 1% of the time doesn't happen ever. What happens if you miss the increment? You'll never do it. You'll never do the, this thing that you wanted to do 1% of the time. What happens if you miss the reset? Instead of doing it in over 100 times, 
I'll do it all but a hundred times. Everyone see the idea? Computer programs are fragile. If you leave out a little bit here or there, it can have a huge impact. And here's a story that happened a couple of years ago. I was on a team doing some performance issues. One of our members emailed something and said, hey, search for this variable and you'll find three references. I initialize it to zero, I declare it, and I have that one test. What's missing? You never reset it. He points out it's initialized, it's incremented, but it's never reset. After the 200th page fault, what it really was, um, the test is always true. This means that every time we need a new buffer, we always flush the queue. This is in the middle of about 10 million lines of code. This is on a medium-sized system, 10 million lines of code, one line was left out. Does that have any impact on the overall system? What kind of impact could that have? In fact, this little example says that instead of doing something every 200th times, you'll do it all but 200 times. You'll do it 200 times more often than you do. It is a really expensive operation that doubled or tripled the number of page volts. It increased the CPU time by about 50%. Among 10 million lines of code, forgetting this one line of code took us from 40% occupancy to 60% occupancy. One line of code has a huge impact on that. What we do is, is pretty interesting. Questions about this? That's a story, I'll, I'll get back to it. So a performance bug, and I've shown you two now, is a minor glitch. There are also major design flaws, things where you should have thought, oh geez, it just can't work. I've had a lot of those too, but I don't want to talk about fundamental design errors. I want to talk about tiny little performance bugs. It's a minor glitch. It's an atypical input. It's one missing line. It's a boo-boo. It's not a, a, a big thing. It's a, little, it's a thinko that doesn't alter the correctness of the program. These programs would pass all the correctness tests. It's not revealed by testing but does cause the program to consume excessive resources. The resources might be CPU time, page faults, whatever, but it, this is what I mean by performance bugs. So I've taken a little time, I've described what I mean. Any questions at all? Let's go. What effect do they have? They can be accretive, where you have death by a thousand paper cuts. One, the other is catastrophic. I hit enter, it just never came back. How are they discovered? Sometimes they're found in the field when they, after they rear their ugly heads. Other times, just by sitting back and perusing code. Uh, what causes them? Unforeseen cases, little typing boo-boos. I left out one line. Um, how do you conclusively nail them down? Tiny, well-structured experiments. Just run the two or three times, show that the time sh that should double and that quadruples, or just a thought analysis. So these two bugs I chose to be pretty far apart in the space just to give you a feeling. Any questions at all? Okay. I'm going to now survey a bunch of problems. I'm going to start with sorting. Question. I don't care about sorting. Well, really you should be more graceful in the way you phrase your questions. That's not even a question. Um, <laughs> but you, you know about it and it illustrates the deep truth. And much more importantly, I've been batting my head against this problem for several decades, and I can speak from sometimes bitter experience. This is sort of the one that I know best. This is home for me, so sucks to be you. Um, <laughs> I'll talk about system issues, about caching memory allocation. I'll talk about just a sampling of some big systems of telling stories from, from, from big systems here. Um, so there I was, minding my own beeswax. Uh, Becker and Wilkes sent me this bug report. Doesn't work, it's broken. What do I do? I tried some other Q-sorts. I tried a dozen of these sort functions. They were traced to three original programs. Each of the three had different ones. If I just filled an array with random zeros and ones, said sort it, it took quadratic time. Is that a case that people really do? Probably not often. But is it one that could be done by a reasonable person? Yeah. A lot of similar bugs, yikes. My colleague Doug McElroy and I had to build a new program. We started simple, we built one. It was in login in all of our tests. If you know what that means, fine. If not, don't worry about it. 
it, it ran in that time. We were really happy with it. We released it to some users. Our first user said, no, <laughs> your program is completely unacceptable. It's way too slow. Yikes, we didn't expect it. How, how slow is it? <sighs> it's way slow. It's in log n. Huh? It takes in log n time on my input. Well, yeah, but we're sporting it in log n. We're, we're cool. It's optimal. I said, no, no, no. Its predecessor took linear time because I was asking it to sort something that was predominantly equal. And the reason you sort often is to bring together equal elements. It's a perfectly valid thing. And the previous program was really fast on that case. Yeah, but we don't, our specification doesn't matter. The user had a performance curio that implicitly, by the mere existence of the preceding program, uh, we had to be as fast as it was. So this program that we felt was just fine, was optimal, was bad for our user. So at that point, we had to implement a program. Should we implement quick sort or heap sort? People in the business who know this, do you have any idea which one is faster, quick sort or heap sort? Part of me? They're both asymptotically in log in, but in terms of real speed, any idea which of the two might be faster? Quick sort by about how much? Uh, I think it's a heap sort kind of bad caching There are two things. One that I learned when I had a class from Don Knuth in 1973 on sorting and searching is that it's about 30% faster. So I'm going to go for that one. And in fact, it is about 30% faster. Here's some data, except, yikes. If n is somewhere between here and around 8,000, it's about 30% faster. Here, the difference spreads, and up here, it goes really crazy. So the answer that I learned a long time ago is true up to what's going on here. Where are the caches? What caches can you see in that picture? Yeah, the L1 cache goes up to about 8,000. We're sorting elements here that are size 4,000. This happens to be a 32K L1 cache. And what else can you see there? The L2 cache is about half a meg. So here, sometimes you can get performance bugs. If I did all my experiments in this domain versus that domain and then ran it for data in a different domain, yikes. So here, someone I mean, hardware designers are magicians. They give us memory that's really cheap, but it appears to be fast because of these caching, but we have to be respectful of it, that sometimes there are performance issues. Will this be reflected in any correctness test? Not at all. It, it's completely hidden. They work correctly, but these performance issues come up. Um, experiments in one range don't necessarily... <laughs> both of these should be a straight line, and in fact, the bottom one is close to a straight line. There's one bump. The top one is sort of three straight lines because of the caching issue that you mentioned. And these sensitivities can have a big impact as you're designing systems. So caching has a huge influence. We were a bit... I, I want to make sure we don't need to rush it all. I'm going to go through a different QSort bug. Um, yeah. Um, Let's go through that one. Here's a big system. Um, I was consulting on a big system, and we had a bunch of, the essence of this system was uh, we had a bunch of pages we were putting past us, and I made a page profiler, a prototype page profiler, an alliterative prototype page profiler that's a lot of fun to say, and I encourage you to say it yourselves. Um, and what we did was just count among 10 million page hits what are the addresses? How often does it happen? What's the page address? And what's the instruction address uh, that caused the page fault? When we did that, among 10 million hits, we were surprised to find that the number one thing occurred a lot more than number two. Um, one might think that the distribution would be a, a zip distribution. Not so. The number one thing was hit three quarters of a million times. The number two thing was occurred 200,000 times. What's going on there? It bears investigating. About 7.5% of the faults come from that one instruction. Second, third, and fourth place are only about 2%. Time to check that instruction. We dispatched a programmer to do it, and when we did it, here's what we found. The code looks like this. 
do not deliver the following lines enabled. <laughs> this is in a body of about 10 million lines of code, and there are a lot of, I'm sorry, 10 million non-comment source lines of code. There are a lot of comments too. Uh, probably 30 million lines of code with comments. Do not deliver the following lines enabled. These are only used for automated unit testing. This program was first built in the late 1970s. It's been around for 30 years, a creaking crud. Um, there was an MR we filed about disabling this. Just disable that. Uh, as the comment indicates, it's only for automated unit testing, should not be enabled. Additionally, it causes code to be executed unnecessarily. Another, so it just had a horrible impact on shadowed memory at that point. The result was because of that one excess line of code, the entire system was about 7.5% slower than it needed to have been. One line of code. Uh, who here works or has ever worked on software that contains a million or more lines of code? Who here um, that has worked in those big programs is absolutely sure in those million line programs that it contains nothing at all like this? You're morally certain it contains. <laughs> Who here, if you've worked on big systems, think that your system too probably contains little boo-boos like that one or the other one? All I'm trying to do here is raise awareness that this, this is the enemy. We have many enemies as, as system designers. We have to think about uh, the overall design of the system, we have to think about the algorithms, but this little nickel and dime sloppy stuff that has no intellectual merit whatsoever comes back to bite us in the butt. Another alliteration, but um, uh, absolutely true as well. Uh, this is where a lot of the battle is won and lost. A bit more perspective. What causes performance bugs? I've shown you two tiny goofs. Just not even thinkos, typos. Just leave a comment in, one line missing. Uh, one problem with stack space that I glossed over. Um, a different nature of input. Um, uh, Tom Duff had duplicate input, but his expectations were to be fast. There was an implicit contract there. You can't make the system slower. Underlying system behavior. All of these things are the kinds of things that you have to think about to avoid these dreadful performance bugs. How do you fix performance bugs? How do you find them? How do you fix them? This is an intermediate test. Uh, the number one thing is awareness. Um, uh, I'm a, um, a, a volunteer at EMT in New Jersey. I have taken lots of classes. All the classes are uh, vehicle extrication awareness, then technician, and uh, all these things above it. This is just an awareness level for you. These things exist. Think about it. Think about how you can do it. Performance testing, just to see where they were, like that uh, page profiler, is a great thing. And finally, I've shown you these little definitive experiments that show that, yes, this is indeed where the problem is. Questions at all? Don't hold them till the end. Just blurt them out now if you have any. Yes? So, so you, you would, I mean, it's sort of a question, it's sort of a comment, but you would, you would make the analogy with unit tests, with, with testing, you know, and it's not a, I was thinking about it, uh, where uh, where I wrote a program that did some sort of searching kind of thing, you know, and, and I don't think this is uncommon, you know, so we, I'd have a test bucket and I'd run it against that and I and I maybe even had instrumented some counts or this kind of thing, but I also counted the, the elapsed time. But it was, it was largely hand, you know, I, I ran it, I looked at it and that kind of thing. And it occurred, you know, what you were saying, there's no reason that these kinds of things the kinds of things they do are very stereotypical. There's no reason they couldn't be automated in the same way that testing is automated. Do you know of such a system or blah, blah, blah? I've known a number of individuals that do exactly this, that whenever you do a unit test, do two things. One is measure the actual wall clock time, and things will change on the wall clock time. But if you ever go from requiring a minute and seven seconds to a minute and 10 seconds, is that a big deal? I don't know. A minute and seven seconds to Four minutes? Yeah, look at it very carefully. No, but you see, that could be 
Uh, exactly. But do that is in every test you write, automate it and have and then do a, essentially a, a diff of the output and a diff of the times and see if the times are, are um, significantly different by some measurement. So I, I have done that in software where I have a biggish system uh, where I test it and in the test just compare both the um, uh, things that you're really looking for and compare the times, make sure the times are close enough and automate that. So whenever you push a big button to crank it out, just do all those tests again and automate all that and check the times carefully. And all of those things. Uh, monitor all the resources very carefully. That just like when you go into a hospital, they slap uh, an, e, uh, an EKG on you just to monitor things. Uh, they, they take your pulse. You can monitor a big system from the outside by looking at these key variables. Look at those key ones and look at every other one in our business. We have no excuse not to monitor every single number that's available and make more available. Thank you. Memory allocation bugs. Who here has ever been bit by a memory allocation bug? Cool. Um, usually you run out of memory, weird things happen, it goes out way too early. I had one where my program was surprisingly and painfully slow. As soon as I profiled it, uh, I noticed that the lion's share of the time goes to allocation. Yikes. I then beat on it for about a day. I got the program from being a few thousand lines of code down to being about that long. I got it down to there, just just malloc some things and see what happens. I did that, ran some tests, time it, double it, time it, double it, instead of going up by, and it's the same old story. I, I've focused on things that you think should be linear that go to quadratic uh, that do this. Yikes. I did this. I found this in the early 1990s. I run over to my friend, Doug McElroy, and I say, Doug, look at this. Those morons at such and such a corporation, they think they can ship a Unix. Look at this sloppy design. Their malloc, ha, 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 takes quadratic time. Doug's response was, that's my code. <laughs> This guy is a great computer programmer. How could he write this code? Well, he was an excellent designer who designed code in his world. His world was that he had made the code 15 years earlier. 15 years earlier, the machine has 64,000 words of memory. His code runs in times C1n plus C2n squared. C2 was tiny, it's negligible. As an engineer, we ignore these negligible things all the time. So he tuned it so the dominant term was always small. 15 years later, if Moore's law says that you double every one and a half years, 15 years, 1.5 times 10, that's two to the 10th is about 1,000. 15 years is gonna be 1,000 times bigger. The machine, after 15 years, had a thousand times as much memory. Not surprisingly, what happened to his design? This design that was perfectly reasonable in the context all of a sudden was something that some kid was trying to laugh at. How will the code that you write today look in 15 or 30 years? How will it look after a factor of a thousand or after a factor of a million? Do most engineers have to worry about a factor of a thousand? You know, when the, the fellows over there at Boeing designed their design and they, they built an airplane, is someone going to, in the next 15 years, increase that airplane's length by a factor of a thousand? That would be really embarrassing. I, I'm a complete addict of the teaching company's wonderful courses. I do a lot of the courses uh, that I listen to uh, on um, uh, CDs, but I just finished listening to Steve Ressler, who's a professor at West Point, give a wonderful course on the great structures. Uh, just came out from the teaching company. Among other things, he talks about the Bear Mountain Bridge. Who here has ever seen or been over the Bear Mountain Bridge? Great bridge. Uh, its span, main span, is about 1,632 feet. Uh, I had no idea, but at one point in 1924 to 1926, it was the longest suspension bridge in the world. A beautiful structure. But what's harder, hardware or software? Uh, you know, 
if you ask for a do-over, in most of what we do, you just press some buttons and you can start over again from scratch. A do-over is pretty easy in the software world. If you get a bridge design where you made a, a little mistake and all the steel gets wet, a do-over is really pricey. So in a certain sense, software is easier than hardware. But on the other hand, what happens if you scale that bridge design by a factor of 1,000? That happened to poor Doug McElroy's code. Somebody scaled it by a factor of 1,000. If you take that bridge design and shrink it down to I want to throw a span across about a 1.6 1, 1. foot long chasm, do you build little tiny towers with cute little wires? You know, it just doesn't work that way. You get out a girder and you throw it across. Um, if you're going to take that same design and make it instead of 1.6 thousand feet, you make it 1.6 million feet, can you just scale that design proportionally? Can you scale that design by a factor of two? It calls for a complete redesign to go from there to the George Washington Bridge. It's, it's the same idea, but a factor of two is a, a big deal. So here, we have to watch about that. Consider in bridges two, that if you left in one test rivet, that rivet would end up weighing as much as 7.5% of the rest of the bridge put together. You pick any place on that design, you put in one rivet that weighs 7.5% of the whole weight of the design, the bridge gets all wet. It's, it's not even close. It, if they had that, it would be difficult. Likewise, I show you if leaving out one line of code makes something 200 times more pricey. If you left out one strand of wire in the main cable and that increased the main cable weight by a factor of 200, what would happen? So the, the important thing here is that just like when Paul Revere rode along war firing his gun and ringing his bell and warning the British that they would not take our guns, I am here, my friends, to tell you Uh, that we should approach the construction of software with a little more humility than we do. This stuff really is hard. You know, that we get, we get lulled by the fact that it's so easy to do a do-over, we don't realize that things can be this precarious. Any questions at all about this? A notification system. At some nameless telecommunication company, we wanted to build a system that would mix and match ways of getting information to people. I want to send out a faux message to that. If that doesn't work, I'll leave you voicemail. I'll send you text. I'll send you email. I'll get in your beeper. Uh, all these things. I'll send you an IM. All these ways. And I worked with the testers, and they said, OK, the, the essence here is this is mixing and matching a lot of things. We want to look at this and make sure that all these guys play well together. Does each one of these various things play well and interact? All of their test scripts were designed to really test feature interaction. An important thing that gets at a lot of bugs. What's one other kind of test that could tell you if you had certain performance bugs? How would you, uh, what, what is another kind of test that you want to run here expressly to find performance bugs? Load test. A, a load test. And what kind of load test? As heavy as you can And I asked for each dimension, just do it for phone alone. Do it for voicemail alone. Do it for text alone. And all, the above. all the above. And then mix and match. But just for each one by itself, don't mix and match. Just see for that dimension alone what happens. Zoomed right through development. After about five months of banging and requesting and pleading, about five months later, we got the tests. And when we did one test, how long to send email to end recipients? To send it to a 1,000 recipients? 11 seconds. Is that good? Is that fast enough? Is that slow? I don't know. Um, 2,000. 4,000. Yikes. In some companies, it would be perfectly reasonable to want to send email out to 100,000 employees, and it would have taken 29 hours. Completely, you know, that they were hoping for minutes. Uh, quadratic growth is bad. In real terms, it's horrible by looking at each dimension independently. Most of the tests were passed with no problem at all. But by forcing this, we forced it 
to instead of focusing on feature interactions, to focus on each dimension to see how important it was. How could you introduce a diseconomy of scale in email? Why, if you want to send out twice as many pieces of email, shouldn't it take twice as long? Fighting spam, it was worse than that. Tony Hoare says that uh, the root of all programming evil is what? Premature optimization is the root of all programming evil. What happened here is that someone said, boy, sending the same piece of email twice is really wasteful. How am I going to get around it? I will keep a sequential structure of the addresses of everyone to whom I have sent email, and now when I want to send out the next piece of email, I'll go down the list. And so when I send out the thousandth piece of email, I'll look at all the previous thousand names. And maybe I won't send it out. Maybe. Uh, a thousand and first, look at all of them again. This means that to send out a thousand pieces of email, you've sent out, you've looked total at a million comparisons gets worse. Premature optimization here turned uh, inherently a linear task into a sequential task. It, and again, as we mentioned before, when you run this test, you should see how many pieces of email were sent, how much time was spent in the, in the mail system. But the CPU time matters too. Measure, count everything, count how many comparisons that thing was making along the way. How do you find such bugs? tiny performance tests along critical dimensions. In addition to looking at the big thing in real context, if you're a bicyclist uh, trying to ride, figure out first how many hours you can ride, or how many miles an hour you can, you can ride in a few minutes. Then how does time affect it? How does going uphill and downhill affect it? How does fatigue after a long day affect it? Do those other things, but first just measure the tiny performance things along the critical dimensions. And here, by going out big, and not that big to begin with, we forced these accretive bugs to become catastrophic. Some of my personal favorites. These are things that I've done myself. Don't blame me, I was raised that way. I changed a function to a macro. From my old evil uh, way of thinking, how much faster could that possibly be? Uh, on a good day with wind behind your back, changing a function to a macro gets rid of some overhead. Maybe the source was a little bit bigger. What sort of improvement are you talking about? Change in runtime are you talking about? You hope. Maybe. Yeah, I was hoping maybe it would be a factor of two faster. Wouldn't this be cool? Change a function to a macro for the speed of a factor of two, maybe? In this one, it gave me a slowdown of a factor of 10,000. <laughs> Something I hope for a factor of two. Why? It turns out it was a recursive function. At the end, I returned the max of A and B and C. And in the function that evaluated them once, recursively passed it back in the function, it, in the macro, it was forced to reevaluate it. And I changed the uh, recurrence relation describing it. I took a linear function to be cubic, roughly. It's just horrible. So sometimes, again, premature optimization, always major things, be careful. I just worked on this system uh, last year where if one person had gone through the system and changed one number from 8191, it was the, the modulus of a hash function, it was the size of a hash table. If they changed it from 8191 to 8192, and that's a good number, 2 to the 13th, I love that number. Um, uh, I'd be inclined, 8191 is prime. I like primes too, but how are the two primes? You know, um, it slowed down things by a factor of 1800. I was leaving an unexploded bomb in the middle of this large software system by having this hash table there. We had to document the heck out of it, saying, "This is a weird number. It's a prime. If you ever change it, go to a prime, conduct these tests." Uh, when I first did this. I was working on that with a, a colleague, and I said, here's a hash function. Uh, he showed me his functions, and I said, well, try, try this kind, and by the way, make it a prime. He said, why should I make it a prime? And I said, uh, b -b 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 because I read about it in a book 30 years ago. Just, it's not a prime now, it works fine. Did some experiments, found this case where it was that kind of slowdown. Part of me. 
we didn't even need to do that. In this big system, I wanted to keep things as simple as possible. There's a lot of things we can do, but here we put it in and we just documented it carefully about make sure that's prime, that that's sort of the magic bit. Um, some people have reversed a search. We came to one place where if you reverse the search, it would be a slowdown by a factor of 75. These are things that I put into systems, and I'm now much more sensitive of these things that I'm doing predominantly for the purpose of making things faster could make things very much slower. Here are the performance bugs that I've mentioned to you. Changing the nature of inputs to be sorted, giving this organ pipe thing. Forgetting one simple reset to zero. I make something that I can prove mathematically is optimal, and my user tells me it's too slow. Different speeds and different part of the memory hierarchies. I glossed over the stack space. Um, a unit test that was should have been turned off was in fact enabled. The memory management system is used in a context that was a factor of a thousand larger than its designer ever anticipated. He built a program for right now. People thought it was a program for all time. Are your programs programs for the next five years or are they programs for all time? How do you intend them? How will they be used? Somebody made a system faster by caching a recipient list. Minor changes to code. All these are just little tiny one-line changes and they have disastrous effects. What causes performance bugs in general? Changes to code, tiny goofs, thinkos, typos, small changes with big input, doing that scan before email. New inputs, inputs of unexpected size, uh, the sort with caching, different nature of inputs. The user expectations. You really have to be careful to design some things you can add on to a system. Some things have to be designed into the system from the start. Security and performance have to be designed into the system from the very start. Knowing what the user really wants has to be designed there. You find out if you didn't design it in, test early and ask the user, is this fast enough? Is this adequate for your needs? Underlying system behavior. It's good right now, but as I port my design in different contexts, is the underlying system going to support my system appropriately in, in, in those contexts? How do you attack performance bugs? All the way from soup to nuts. Today, I, I wish I could give you a certificate that says that each one of you has performance bug awareness. If nothing else, you've, you've wasted an hour, a perfectly good hour of your life, uh, but you're now aware of what performance bugs are. When you specify software, talk then about what kind of performance is required. In the initial design, do it that way through the coding. Uh, make sure that in, in your unit tests you do that, both at the unit test and other things. Develop performance models of your code and make sure that these little software models, an Excel spreadsheet is a fine performance model. Make sure that things are close enough to your performance model. Profiling in various ways, monitoring things in an ongoing way. In every test that you ever conduct, um, monitor it as well. Uh, monitor how much time it takes, how much space it takes, how many RPCs it takes, whatever it is, uh, continue to monitor it. Once you identify the culprit, I've tried to focus today on showing you tiny little experiments to say that this thing is bad. I decided to take, um, essentially this talk is modeled on Sesame Street, where the word for the day is performance bug, and it's Mr. Quadratic is the evil monster that, that we've been uh, uh, getting attacked by. I feel that, that's not the only kind, but it's one that I chose to illustrate because it's, it's one that comes up a lot. How you identify the culprit, how you certify it, and then how you go about repairing things. For performance testing, test both components and the overall system. Monitoring profiling tools, count anything and everything. There is nothing that don't need counting. Just, just, if you can imagine it counting, whether it's microseconds, nanoseconds, kilobytes, uh, page faults, critical events of any sort, furthermore, automate the tests, the analysis, and the meta-analyses. Automate the fact that, gee, my, my numbers in here, uh, this number is only 1% worse than that. Um, if it's 1% worse for 72 times, it'll be twice as slow. Monitor things to make sure you don't have any long-term trends, but monitor all of those. 
automate it, exploit what we have going for us. Um, different kinds of experiments. I've talked about exploratory experiments to find where does the time go, just the, the page profiler. On that system, we sent a lot of pages across a pretty skinny link. No one ever bothered to profile it. All I said was, let's just gather here, just tell me the page addresses that are going across, and we found this one piece that was left in accidentally that accounted for 7.5% of the page uh, uh, transfers. Confirmatory, does it really go there? I've shown you these tiny little dozen line programs where I just pick on the bug and it's evidence you can bring in a court of law and you can have 12 of its fellow uh, functions in a jury box saying guilty. There's no doubt about this, um, that it really does go there for these tiny little pieces. And for maintenance, most of these bugs in my limited experience are introduced when people try to make things faster. You try to make it faster and you end up making it slower. So, I've spent the last 50 minutes of your life talking about performance bugs. Uh, you said you would accrete questions along the way. Are there any questions about anything I've, I've talked about so far? Um, yeah, we have time now. Boy, is this a less than graceful way of doing that. Um, I thought it was closer. Yeah. Um, so my good buddy writes me emails saying, another Q sort, our, our new sort causes system to crash. The maximum number of items sort is 512. I'm only 512 items, but that sort is recursive. And when sorting 512 elements, it ran out of process stack space. So we removed it. We might want to put it back in. It was really handy to have those things sorted. It made it a lot faster. Do you know of another sort algorithm that can use up to 512 32 bit integers that's very fast but doesn't use recursion? Um, an embarrassing clarification. Let's look at the sort. Yeah, it's the one I wrote. So all of a sudden, I had some skin in the game that became sort of interesting. Um, there were two separable issues here. Is the sort really guilty? And the other is, do I know another algorithm? I happened to have spent this morning watching a wonderful video um, about Sikhism and law enforcement. Uh, and sir, I apologize if, if there's any offense, but there was this, this video that a friend of mine sent me about, uh, it started off with, uh, there was a mom and her kid are touring the Jefferson Memorial. They come up and they see a suspicious person in a turban at the Jefferson Memorial taking photographs. And they, they, they get all upset. They talk to a law enforcement officer. The 12 officers go up and approach the sick gentleman. And they say, sir, may we speak to you for a moment? And he says, sure. And well, we heard there's something suspicious going on. He says, well, that's OK. I, I, I'm in law enforcement, too. And it happens that he's a deputy sheriff, and he shows his badge. And uh, um, the point is that we live in a world of prejudice and fear. A lot of programmers are prejudiced against and fear recursion. It's just <laughs> it's sad but true. These people did this. Was it really the sort program that was at fault? It's a recursive program that ran out of stack space. Blame the poor sort program. That, that's how it, it's the old chestnut. Um, so I said, good news. I got 30 lines of code. It's be faster. It's great. But let's make sure that recursion is the culprit. I've attached a little recursive program, and all it does is it just runs through and allocates stack space. Here's its output. On my system, it goes up to around a million that it dies. All we need to do is put it at that point in your program. The first time, just put it in this big monster system. Let the system run. It's going to take half an hour to get up there. Let it run, and this program will do that, and this will test and tell you roughly how much stack space it does. What does my little testing program look like? So here, I just do a similar experiment, put code like this at the place, here's what my code looks like. It doesn't matter, it just sums 1 plus 2 plus n recursively. What it does essentially is say, if n equals 0, return 0, otherwise return n plus the recursive sum of n minus 1. And then in the middle, it uses memory and it thinks around just to try to fool the compiler. I said, here, just do this, run this test, we'll see, is recursion really guilty, is stack space really guilty? I don't think it is. What happened? Anybody want to guess what happened? 
they're developers. They're busy. They're working hard. They found the guilty party. Guilty. Recursion is bad. So. I have no idea. It's a, it's a story with no punchline. I have no idea how it ended. I really wish I did. But you do that a lot. Um, um, I, I have spent much of my life as a consultant. Um, a consultant is often defined as a guy who knows 468 different positions for making love but has never had a girlfriend. Um, um, uh, it's... A lot of times you do this, it seemed like to me like a, a really nice example of a little test program that would get right to the heart of the matter. But they were busy getting out their code. They yanked it. I gave them the other program. I think they put the other program into their system. Sorry, that, that, that's why I glossed over it. I'm telling you the truth here. Any other questions? I'm going back now to uh, the final slide, I hope. Well, I'll leave that. that. That's an inspiring slide. Uh, any other questions? Any suggestions on uh, code tracing programs that you favor? Um, 20 years ago, I could have answered that, but now it all depends on the system and the context. We're at Google. Uh, the essence here is n every story I've told you has been about things that run on one processor. At Google, that's not where the action is. Um, uh, the tools really vary from platform to platform. There are some great tools for particular platforms, but it's very, very platform dependent. And I've been working on some particular things recently on some particular platforms, but uh, I used to keep up with that. I can't anymore. Honest answer. Talk to your friends who use similar platforms, and, and it's very platform dependent. Anything else? Yes. Uh, my, yeah, I really enjoyed writing those columns for CACM. The books have been very, very kind to me. I am deeply grateful for anyone who has ever read the books and much, much, much more grateful to anyone who ever bought the book. Um, um, uh, the, yeah, I, I did an updated version of Programming Pearls about 10 years ago, and it was, uh, I tried to mention in there some approaches to this. Again, use system profilers if you have them, and then add counters, add things, uh, pro measure everything. Um, learn about how real engineers do it, see uh, what they do, and how, um, see the amazing thing is that you can look at that bridge and you can see, you know, the, the, what are the key issues in this bridge? It's supporting weight. You can see where the weight goes. You can watch the weight flow. There is no big surprise for the weight. So in actually in, in a suspension bridge, what are the issues here? Anyone can tell me what the engineering concerns are? Wait, no. Yeah, the, number one, it's the dead load of the bridge itself. Number two, it's the live load. Do you ever put tremendous live load on a bridge like this? Yes. What kind of live load do you put on the bridge? <laughs> Wind's coming down. Well, no, wind is something different. That, that's, um, but snow and ice. Snow and ice uh, for the Golden Gate Bridge, when did they put twice as much load on it as they ever expected they would? Yeah, the, the, no, not, not a marathon. You don't care about that much. <laughs> Runners, in <laughs> context. Uh, no, for the uh, 50th anniversary of the bridge, they had people sort of going across it. They put twice as much live load on as they expect the bridge for. That they expected to have 50,000 people that day. It was like 700,000 people came out that day. They did some math in a hurry, and they found, yikes, there's a factor of two here, but they designed the bridge to take a factor of four. You know, do we have to stop the party? Do we have to go out and throw them off the side or anything? They, they, they didn't have to. But you design for dead load, for live load, for uh, wind. And for suspension bridges, they, they learned a lot about the aerodynamics, uh, and, and they know now how to get around most of those problems. But there you can sort of just look at the flow of things. Tragically, and, and the point that I tried to make today is in software, you know, if there were a rivet there that weighed seven and a half percent of the weight of the foundations, you could see it. In software, you can't see it. You can't see the really expensive pieces. That was the point I was trying to make. And it means that we just have to measure everything and be much more careful about that. Anything else? Uh, the big hand is now near the six. It's time for us to stop. Thank you very much. I'm deeply appreciative of your time.